Welcome to our Cedar Hill YouTube channel. It is so amazing to have you here with us today. We pray that this sermon will impact your life. So have your heart open and get ready to receive. Today is a special day because we are going to dovetail what we preach about um, with an important moment for us as a church. Today, uh, Patrick and Mandy Daniels are going to be um, ordained as elders here at Cedar Hill Church. And so it's a wonderful privilege for us to do that. We're going to tell you a bit of that story in a moment. But I'm going to take the opportunity today to talk a little bit about leadership and eldership in the church. And before you switch off, I want to tie this into our series. So four weeks ago, we began a series called Nurturing Joyful Relationships. Nurturing Joyful Relationships. And the first Sunday, we spoke about our relationship with God. And we, we, we began with the premise. It's just a, a simple premise, and it comes from psychology. As, um, as sociologists and psychologists have studied humans and how we interact and how we do life, we, point, we pointed at a study. I don't know if you remember the study. The, it's a, a, the Harvard study of adult development. It's an 85-year-long study. It's the longest study in recorded kind of academic history. And it was the study of a group of young people uh, from when they were very little, about 780 of them, tracked them all through their life. So it's an 85-year um, <clears throat> project, 85-year-long project. And what they did was they asked the question, what makes humans happy? What makes us happy? And so they studied these young children as they grew up, and they, man, they, did, they, like teach, they treated them like lab rats. They took their blood samples every year. They did every kind of health test they could do. They made them fill out questionnaires about their life and their relationship. And as they grew older, and over these years, this is the conclusion that those who were doing the study came to. That if you want to live the happiest, healthiest, longest life, it happens because of good relationships. Relationships are the key to a long, happy, healthy life. And I made the joke, I said to my wife, You leaving me alone will kill me faster than being fat. (laughs) Obesity is not my problem. You leaving us. (laughs) But good, happy, healthy relationships are so vitally important. And I know that when I said that, every single one of you intrinsically said yes. Absolutely. Because if we look at the worst day of our lives, they are tied to toxic relationships. And if we look at our best days, they are tied to good relationships. And in fact, relationships are a gift from God. (laughs) When God created Adam, He said, Adam, it is not good that you be alone. It's not that good that you be alone. And God made a helper comparable to Him. Made somebody to walk out life with Him. And that's important. And we have many different kinds of relationships. Uh, we have spousal relationships. So I have a wife. Some of you in the, in the room today have a wife or you have a husband. Some of us are single. And so what's important to single people is those close friendships that they have. Hey? But those friendships are equally as important. They are as important for a single person as a marriage spouse is to a married person. But our relationships are important. And they foster mental health and even physical health in our lives, they're vitally important. So we spoke about our relationship with God, and we spoke about how that that is the most important relationship. But if we get that right and we walk with Him, there's just going to be something that is infused into our lives that brings health and strength and courage and vitality, and we keep walking with God. And then we had Paul and Milan with us uh, from New Creation Family Church up in Johannesburg, and they came down, um, and we, that week was, we were going to speak into spouses, into re- marriage relationships. But Paul came and spoke about offense, spoke about offense, eh? pardon me. And he spoke about how that we shouldn't live offended and that we should deal with all those issues in our lives because actually it's those little things that begin to undermine our relationships. So walk with a clean heart with people. Be quick to apologize. If somebody hurts you, be quick to deal with it. Walk in love. Walk faithfully in love. It's an important thing. Gab last week spoke beautifully, spoke about raising children, how we have interact with our children, how we're to love them and to nurture them and to take care of them. But ultimately, all of our lives have significance and meaning and find purpose, and we find vitality in that significance and that purpose and that meaning through good relationships. I want to say good, godly relationships. And so what we will do this week, and we will end next week, is we're going to be talking about the relationship of the community of the church. 
that actually just like God, uh, so pardon me, I'll go back to the store because I kind of missed it. But relationships are a gift from God and so they need to be stewarded. Every gift that comes from God has to be intentionally, purposefully stewarded and stewarded well. So Gav spoke a minute ago about our money, our finances. And there's a way that God asks for us to deal with our money. And so we are faithful with it. And so this is the deal. You may bring 10% to the Lord every month. Give your tithe. Faithfully give your tithe to the Lord. And you're faithful with the tithe, but you're unfaithful with the 90. (laughs) And you get yourself in all kinds of debt and you spend it, you know, you get to the last day of the month and you get 300 rand left. You go, who cares? Let's go have dinner. (laughs) And we can be irresponsible with some of those things. But the reality is we have to steward all of our lives. And the same is true with our relationships. Whether that relationship is with God, whether it's with one another in intimate relationships, spas or friendships or our children, but also in this community as the people of God. And so God has called us to be together. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but let me say this, and hopefully this is, will suffice until we jump into things. When you find a church, what is interesting to me is you don't get to determine who else comes to the church. And in this church, you don't even get to pick who sits next to you. We don't have reserved seating here. Well, we do actually have reserved seating. Those little signs sometimes. Who's ever seen a reserved seating? And it's for our host team. It's for the beautiful people that come and serve. While they're serving you, we just want to make sure that they, that they still have a seat. So, so there is that. Pardon me. Let me recheck that. But the reality is God clumps us together. His, he plants us in a house. And He does so intentionally so that we might learn from one another, that we might love one another, that we might serve one another. And together, love, serve God. <laughs> So it's important. So God puts us together. So we cannot get away from relationships. You can't. Some people are like, I'll do so much better by myself. No, you wouldn't. No, you would not. It's a lie. You know what would happen? You would sink deeper and deeper and deeper into the hole that you've already created. And the deeper you go, the darker it gets. You become Scrooge McDuck. You just hide away. Bah, humbug, Scrooge. No, we were created for relationships, keep us healthy. They keep us sane. They keep us strong. And they also grate up against us to keep us growing. And being the people who, of God and, and who God called us to be. So, God says for us to love, and that's okay. Because some of you are so good at loving yourself. But He intends for us to love others. And He intends for us to love others who are not like us. And that's the struggle. And we'll talk more about that next week. But God's intention for the church is for us to have good, healthy, godly relationships here that are good for us and that help us. And so what God did in designing the church, I just want to say that right from the beginning, the church was not man's idea, it was God's. Now certainly man has gotten hold of it and done all kinds of things to it, and try to make it in his own image, and that's a dangerous thing. But the church was God's idea. And I, basically, I want to say this. Biblically, Jesus is the head of his church who leads and governs the local church through gifted leaders, with the eldership being the ultimate accountable, uh, ultimately accountable to God for the local church. So essentially what God, God does is he sets up a church, and he gathers us together, and then from amongst us, he raises up leaders, men and women, who will sit as elders in a church to help govern and guard and direct that church for God, under Jesus. See, it was for God. That was God just wanted you to know this is all for Him and not for me or any other elder. It's for Him. So according to the New Testament, elders are responsible for the primary leadership and oversight of the church. And God has given them for your benefit. The leaders in the church are for your benefit. I'll be honest with you. I would not have picked this job. Now for some of you thinking, hey, pastor, how can you say that? The Lord and I have chatted about this. I would have picked a job that paid a lot better. (laughs) That That gave me a house on the beach in Hawaii. 
We would have picked something different. (laughs) But God, for the sake of me and you, put us together. He said, Wes, this is the responsibility I want to give to you. And so he's given us this responsibility. Gavin and Wendy, myself and Cor, and today, Pat and Mandy. It's for the oversight of the church. It's for your benefit. The function and the role of an elder is well summarized. So there's a book by a man named Alexander Strauch. And it's a book called Biblical Eldership. And he lists a couple of things that the Bible says are the roles and responsibilities of elders. He says, elders lead the church. They're not, they're not the church, but they lead it. They're to teach and preach the word. They are to protect the church from false teachers. They are to exhort and admonish the saints in sound doctrine. We're to help you govern your life towards faithfulness and fruitfulness in following Jesus. James tells us, James 5, 14 says, we're to visit the sick and we're to pray for them. We're to, and and we're to judge doctrinal issues. So in a biblical terminology, uh, elders are shepherds. They're overseers. They're called to lead and to care for the local church. They are given for your benefit. Make sense? I would like to believe that you keep coming back Sunday in and Sunday out because every time you come, God does something significant in your life. He strengthens you. He encourages you. He enables you. He empowers you. He corrects you. He's leading you. I'd like to believe that for some of us, not all of us, because not all of us are connected in this way, and our prayer is that we would all be connected in this way, but I'm, I, I believe that there's some of you that are connected with others of you, that there are good godly friendships and connections that have begun in this church, and you meet together, some of you regularly once a week, and you encourage one another in the Scriptures, and you pray for one another uh, in, in your homes, and you eat with one another, and you shepherd one another's hearts. Those are important things. That's God's plan and purpose for your life. And it comes about as a result of the local church. The local church is God's command for our lives. And He says for us not to neglect gathering together as some would do. But He says, come together, and He gives us Elders, leaders. So what are elders? Very quickly, the Hebrew root word, uh, the Hebrew word uh, for elder, the root is gray. (laughs) So an elder in the Old Testament was a gray-haired one. And what it meant was maturity. That's what it meant. It meant that there were older, elder people amongst us who had lived a little longer, seen a little bit more, and were able to direct and encourage the people of God towards greater faithfulness and fruitfulness in their lives. And so that's where the root word comes from. It's interesting. But over in the New Testament, that designation is not the same. Actually, it's not about a physical age. It's not dependent on you being a certain age. I actually found out just by happenstance that if you want to be the president in America, you cannot be younger than 35. That is legally written into their constitution. But apparently you can be 80-something. Anyway. But being an elder in the local church, in the New Testament church, is not dependent on your age, but rather it's determined by spiritual maturity and wisdom. So what are we looking for in our elders? We're looking for a spiritual maturity, and we're looking for a wisdom. We're looking for a faithfulness to God. And then elders are a team. Elders appear in Scripture in the plural sense, in teams. They never operate alone. So God's plan and purpose for the church is not for you to be led by Wesley Pulvinus. Because Wesley Pulvinus, left to his own devices, will tend towards selfishness, self-preservation, and his own benefit in some way. Oh, no, pastor, we love you. You're way better than that. Well, I don't know. Because if God thought that, he would have left it alone to me. But he didn't. He said the church must be led by a team of, of, of men and women, by a group, a plurality of elders. That's what we believe. And it's scriptural. It's not my... This is not my... um. My preference, if you read the scriptures, you'll see that. But that team is to be led. So teams are led. And every team needs a leader. We would say a leader amongst equals. Or it becomes a democratic committee, and every leader leads a team, or they tend to autocracy. How do you say that? Autocracy. (laughs) Gavin, you tied my tongue up there earlier. So, so if we're a team and, it's, and there's just the leader and there's no leader, then it becomes a democracy. We all vote and we see what happens. But actually, scripturally, God calls somebody to lead. He gives that person a vision and a mandate to lead, a Moses, a David, a, a Daniel, whoever. But God doesn't allow us to lead by ourselves. We lead in a team so that we 
draw together and follow Jesus. And that's an important thing because it's a biblical model. It's the New Testament biblical model. I want to say this very quickly. We carry baggage. Uh, said another way, I'm not perfect. Gavin's not perfect. Patrick's not, P- Patrick's not perfect. Mandy, Wendy, and Corrine are a little more perfect than us. <laughs> but we are not perfect. Now, I, when I was thinking about this in these notes, I was thinking, this is not, so we can, we can say this as leaders, oh, I'm not perfect, and we can say it in a way to, um, to cover up our bad behavior. Okay. We can say, oh, I'm not perfect to get away with doing things we shouldn't. Okay. That's not the reason I say it. Myself and Gavin and Patrick and, uh, and our precious wives are committed to following Jesus faithfully. My desire is not to sneak into heaven or to crawl into heaven, but to be welcomed in as a good and faithful servant. <laughs> our desires are to live holy and righteous before the King, to pursue Him daily in the Scriptures, to pray faithfully for you, to serve God in such a way that I hold what we do with honor and with a weightiness to say, this is not mine, this is His. And I will be judged accordingly. But we do carry baggage. The meaning of elders, or elders in the biblical dictionary or definition, okay? But our lived experiences, uh, how we model our lives in the church, all of our experiences, they add to how we, we lead, okay? So, so some of us lead, we, we all lead out of our brokenness sometimes. We can all lead out of a, out of a, a struggle, so, uh, for instance, I may have a problem with authority. Like that, that's, you know, the Bible says there's the sin and the weight that so easily besets us. So maybe my problem is authority. <laughs> and so when I get together with Gavin, we're trying to make a decision, and Gavin says, where's, I don't think we should do that. No, we're not doing it. I go, no ways. Like, because I've got a struggle, so now I want to fight with Gavin about it. But actually, you just go, you know what, Gav? What I know to be true is that God has ordained you to be an elder, not, not Wesley Pulvinus. He's put His Spirit on you and His Spirit in you. And so God is obviously keeping your heart in this moment from something, so we're not going to make a bad decision. We're going to trust that there's wisdom in us to lead us. And when there's agreement, we'll move forward. Other times, Gab's like, Wes, I actually don't know. I don't really feel like we should be doing this, but at the same time, you're leading and we're with you. So if you really feel like this is the thing that we should do, we should preach on that series, I'm with you. I don't have any particular opinion about it with you. And we go, okay, there's wisdom in that, we'll go. So we move together as a group, but the, we do have baggage. And we do have struggles, and we do have bad days. You may phone us for counseling, and we go, okay. And we look at our diaries, and we go, look at the bad example. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you in three weeks, Tom. No. But so, you, so my point is, is that we're not perfect people but we do want to follow Jesus and we are responding to a call and a grace that He's placed in our lives. So leaders often carry hurt. They can carry spiritual abuse from other pastors, other leaders, and those things form our understanding of and our reaction to eldership. Okay. So even in the room today, some of you may have been part of churches where there were leaders who were dictators. And maybe leaders who told you, if you don't follow me or do what I say, you're going to be cursed. or Something wrong is going to... I've got a friend of mine who left the church. And, um, and when he was leaving, this is going back many years because he's been in ministry. He's like nearly uh, in his 60s. And he says the day when they left that church, the pastoral team that were leading it looked at him and said, said to them, you're, le- you're leaving this church and it's wrong. You're supposed to stay here. And nothing you do will ever prosper. Nothing you do will work. In fact, you're probably going to die because you, you're stepping out of the will of God. And this friend of mine and his wife jumped on a plane to go overseas because they went to a Bible school in America. And he tells the story, he says his wife was petrified getting onto that plane because she was sure that plane was going to go down because God was going to kill them. I want to tell you that's manipulation and control and that no leader has the right to ever do something like that. And so I know that for some of you, even in the room, you may be thinking, oh, you've got elders. Oh, gosh, you hear elders and you start, you know, (laughs) gyrating. I want to say to you, God's plan is eldership. Good Godly elders. And we can make mistakes. And we should work not to. And that's why in a team, we should do better. God's idea is that we would do better. 
Then in the Old Testament theocracy, God was, it was the kingdom rule. God was in charge. He is always in charge. And it was by the institution of elders in a city or a town. So that's what happened. In, in, in towns and places, they had eldership and they had these leaders and they ran and governed things. And the way that it worked was those elders, okay, they would be subject to kings, priests, and judges, and prophets that would come in and through the towns. So there may be a town who had elders and they led the town, and then all of a sudden Samuel the prophet arrived. And they go, oh, okay, Samuel's here. Let's listen to what he says. And in the same way the church is run that way, the local church is led by an eldership. Myself, Gavin, Pat, and our beautiful wives. And then we have the, the high king, priest, prophet, <laughs> apostles. <laughs> we have Keith and Shelley, who act as an apostolic oversight, who help us govern, who help us lead, who hold us to account. Who, if it, they see anything wrong in our lives, should be able to challenge us and help us. And that's a, so in the Old Testament, there were elders and there were kings and priests and prophets. In the New Testament, we have our, our local church led by elders and then we have oversight into that. And for us, that's Church of the Nations, Cotton. So Keith and Shelley represent that here in our community. And we're appreciative of them and are thankful for them. And we've said that many times to them, so I don't want to overdo that. But we just love and appreciate their wisdom and their grace and their courage that they give to us to lead. Then just quickly, um, there are a bunch of words, I know I'm jumping around you a little bit, but there are a bunch of words in the New Testament um, that talk about eldership. So have you heard the word bishop? Yeah. Bishop, overseer, and um, elder. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but the more I've researched it and read that, bishop, overseer, and elder are really the same thing. Okay. If you look at those words in the context of the Scriptures, they're really the same the same thing. They all point to how we're to lead the church um, and to do that. And everyone is to lead with wisdom, um, with good governance, teaching, with accountability in that. They are to shepherd, so they're to care, and they're to shepherds are to, are to lead, heal, they help grow, feed people, um, teach them. Bishops carry vision and direction and oversight, coordinating, administering. So when the Bible talks about these functions, okay. These are all of the things that they talk about. And so this is what is supposed to be embodied in an eldership. Okay. Elders set vision, direction for the church. They're an oversight for the church. They administrate the church, but they are to shepherd the church. And so they are to pray for you and to bring about healing in your life and to feed you and to strengthen you and encourage you. We are here to lead you as a spiritual um, group of leaders. Then just quickly, all of these words also point to a mix of gifts. <laughs> um, they're not necessarily a job description of how we should all be, but they're about the gifts and the graces that we carry as leaders. And so each of us are wired a little differently. There's a different grace and anointing on our lives, and that is for the benefit of the church. You know, when you read the scriptures in Ephesians 4, it talks about there's uh, like the fivefold ministry. Hey, so we talk about apostles, prophet, or prophets, uh, prophet, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And God, Jesus is all of those. But what Jesus doesn't do is give one man all of those. He takes his gifts and he pours them into the lives of the church, into different people, so that we need one another so that we are reliant on one another, so that we work together, so that we grow together. That's important. And so there's, there should be a diversity in a leadership team, and we should see and, and admonish or acknowledge the grace and the gifts and the call of God um, upon those, those men and those um, women. All right, sorry, let me just grab my notes here again. All right. Then quickly, just to say, with elders... It is, a, it is a grace calling or an anointing to do this. So leadership in the church is a grace gift. In Romans 12.8, the, uh, the Greek means a one who stands before or in front of others. And so the, the grace to do this and to lead actually comes from God. It's an anointing from God to, to do this. Um, I, I, think of, I think of so many people that have, over the years, pastors, leaders, and teachers who say, where's naturally, I can't speak in front of people. 
naturally it's not my, my gift, it's what I want to do. But you look at them, you think, wow, dude, you were born to speak in front of people. Like it's just, it's an amazing, you have a great gift, but actually it's an anointing. It's a, it's a gift from God. So remember, the gift and the grace on our lives is for your benefit. It's like the worship team that leads. You know, I say, you know, like Vikesh doesn't get up in the morning and sing love songs to himself in the mirror. <laughs> Wait, with that new haircut, I'm a bit concerned. Yeah. <laughs> but but the, the gift in his life to sing is for the benefit of the church. The gift on Kareen's life and Raven's life and Nolan's life, as they lead, is for the benefit of the church. So too with the, gr- the grace gift to lead. So it's a gift. It's anointing. So I want to I encourage you. Today we are going to ordain and pray um, Patrick and Mandy into eldership. And God gives them to you, us to you, to lead and to govern, to guard your life, to help you, to direct you, to pray for you, all these things. But you also have a responsibility to the eldership. In fact, the Bible says don't make their lives difficult. That's what the Scriptures tell us. I want to encourage you to pray for us as an eldership team. To keep us, to pray for our families and to pray for us as we pray for you and for your families. Because what happens is when there is a healthy head, there's a healthy body. We know Jesus is healthy and then we come in His authority and His anointing and as there's health and as there's unity and as there's love and there's faithfulness and there's commitment here together as a team, that will, that will kind of not go down because I hate that image of hierarchy in the church because that's not what it is. But it, it'll, it'll, it'll flow out to the rest of us. So, it's a wonderful privilege for us as a church to acknowledge grace and gifting and calling on a person's life as God begins to raise them up and elevate them so that they might lead the church, that there may be um, more of that anointing and their grace in their lives. And so we acknowledge it. As a community, we're saying, okay, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the gift of eldership. Thank you for the gift of leadership in our church. Lord, we choose to submit. And we choose to receive them as those uh, as those leaders. Then just quickly, um, all right, we're not going to go into that today. So I think we've got, I think we're out of time really. So Keith, maybe if you can, can come up. I know you're going to share, are you ready to share some stuff? I know. So maybe we can just get the, the microphone. You guys are actually supposed to come up as well. So maybe if we can come up together, it'll just help. Great. Can you put the, just scroll through those pictures, if possible. Okay, you can just stop there. So that's, that's a long time ago. <laughs> I had a whole lot more hair. <laughs> He's got some grey hair there. I've got some grey in my beard. We qualify. Uh, Pat's way more qualified now. <laughs> but we've known Pat and Mandy. Um, you can carry on through the pictures. We've known Pat and Mandy since about 2012, 2013 you, you joined. Eh? That, that was 2013. This is just to show you that they just didn't rock up last week and we decided, hey, these are cool people. Pat can chat. You can go to the next one. This, if we can just stop there. Um, this was a beautiful moment um, where Pat, <laughs> Pat got to baptize his son um, on a weekend where, where really God just downloaded into their family some amazing, amazing stuff. Um, Lester's a beautiful young man, and, and we all know that God's got huge amazing plans for him he's just got to realize it now himself eh? um, but yeah if you go next one yeah that was proof that he was baptized <laughs> did get wet. Yeah. i didn't want to miss that part it wasn't just for show um so men's breakfast next week um this was the last one we had at baggies if you remember pat we, we had just like arbitrary guys just rocking up and sitting down and going, what are you guys on about? No, we're preaching. And it was amazing. It was absolutely incredible. When men, when men get together like that around God, it just does something, you know. Um, and then I think there's one more after that. Um, is there one more? Is that two more? Two more. 
Uh, oh, that was COVID. Remember when the lights and nothing worked inside and we had to preach outside? Pratt just took it by horns. He grabbed that and ran and helped me out awesomely that morning. And then the last one, awesome. Just so, yeah, that, you can take it off. I don't like pictures of myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just to, to show we walked a long road with Pat and Mandy, and they, they're incredible. Um, Wayne's going to just share a little bit about Mandy. But, but they exemplify family. Um, and something that um, maybe like Wes and I don't, aren't as strong as in, in what God's called us and, and the giftings on our life is pastoralship. And um, Pat and Mandy are the epitome of that. Their, their love for people, Pat, Pat's genuine love for people is, is something special, something to behold. And, and I'm always in awe of how much they love people and how easy they love people. It's a very, very special gifting that they have. And um, we as a team are privileged to have them on board. And, um, yeah, we just, we just love and cherish you guys. And Pat, I, I just I honor you for the man of God that you are and um, the great husband that you are and the great father that you are. And, and, and those, those are the things that, that for me are way more important as, whether he knows what scripture and the address of a scripture and all of that, that's important. But, but the fact that he's living those scriptures out in his life and it's reflected in his life is way more important for me and I know for Wes as well. It's the character and, and his love and desire to, to please and to, to worship and to represent Jesus well. So that's just my little bit on awesome Pat. Mans, this actually applies to both of you, but what you see is what you get. There is nothing false about you. When you deal with people, when you speak to people, when you serve, you are the example of a servant's heart. Both of you. I have never in all the years, have I ever heard you grumble about anything have I ever seen you not with a smile on your face? Ever. And that is a beautiful quality to have. And that is Jesus just shining through you. And that's how you, as a couple, individually touch people's lives. What you see is what you get, and that's Jesus. You live for Jesus. And you love like Jesus loved. And you are a great example of. And let's say, dynamite comes in small packages, Mandy, and you are proof of that. And you've got just such a beautiful way of speaking. The wisdom and the discernment that you have from the Father, you impart in everybody that you come in contact with. And so we are privileged to have you join us in this beautiful team. So thank you for who you are. Awesome. So I've just asked Keith just to share um, for a bit, and, um, and then we're going to take a moment to lay hands on Pat and Manny and ordain them as elders in our community. So I'll just give you the stage. I know it's hot. <clears throat> I know it's time gone. Um, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of what's happening this morning. Shelley and I have been in ministry since 1979. And in that time, I have seen leaderships that work. I have seen leaderships that don't work. I have seen leaderships that honor God. I have seen leaderships that bully. I have seen leaderships that represent what the characteristics are of what the scriptures say. And I have seen leaderships that don't. And it's for that reason that I think the Word of God says very clearly, don't ever lay hands on somebody and put them into an office of leadership easily or quickly. Because so often where we have not done the spade work, where we have not done the ground work, where we have not fulfilled the things that the Scriptures teach us about is where it goes wrong. And, and Wesley, even though he's rushed through what he said this morning, has done an outstanding job of bringing to our attention 
what biblical leadership is all about. If you didn't get it this morning, or if you were distracted, or if the heat has got to you, or if you're conscious of the time, watch it when it gets downloaded sometime this week, I would imagine, onto the YouTube channel. Just watch these 20 minutes that he has spoken about, because it is imperative that we understand what we are doing today. This is not just delaying the service. This is a very, very important thing that's happening here. And he's covered everything that needs to be said. My contribution before we pray for Pat and Mandy this morning is simply to say this. The additional things that I see as important. Number one, remember that all talk about church is is set within the context of family. So in family, we don't operate on the basis of bosses and underlings. In family, we operate on the basis of fathers and sons, moms and daughters. So any kind of leadership that is biblical is going to come forth from a father or a mother's heart. And it is a very bad father and a very bad mother who sets out to brutalize their kids or to bring chaos into the home, or to not have the home's best interests at heart. The fabric of society is built on family. So when leaders are doing the opposite of that, we are are empowered to question how that leadership got into place and why that leadership is in place, because it's not biblical. We lead from the position of fathers and sons, moms and daughters. So whether Wesley and Corrine or Gavin and Wendy or Patrick and Mandy are judged, let them be judged on the basis of are they giving you the example of what Bible says is moms and dads responsibility and the way we are supposed to be moms and dads in a house. I think the other thing that I simply want to say is this, that eldership is not a title. It's a responsibility and it is a function. So Wesley said it, we're not here into a hierarchy. I've been in churches where people have been promoted because of their age and they're too old to be a deacon, so we can't call them a life deacon, so we make them an elder. So it's not a reward for long service. You're not going to get a gold watch from the church for 30 years service as a deacon and then you become an elder. It's not a title that we can aspire to or try and grab hold of or try and improve our performance in the church so that we can grab somebody's attention so that we can become an elder because then we've made it. If that's the motivation, we've got the wrong people in place. In fact, most people, Wesley said it already, I shook my head in deep agreement after 45 years in ministry. Most people who operate in leadership would say to you, it's the last thing on earth I want to do in church. That's the servant heart. That's the kind of person who sees it not as being a title, but as being a responsibility and a function and can then operate in that. It's easy to put people into eldership. Sometimes you need the A team to get them out of eldership. (laughs) Oh, only the boomers know who the A team is, eh? Okay. All right. You need a strike force. Because you see, if we realize that it is our grace and our gifting and our anointing, there may be a time that elders have outgrown that function and we need to ask them to stand down. But if I see it as a title or as a reward, I'm going to fight you because it says as much about me and my self-identity than about what I'm doing. So families... You become a father by raising sons. It's not a a thing that you sign up for. It's not a title. It's a function. 
The Bible speaks about character. You've heard already endorsements of Patrick and Mandy in a way that I could never endorse them because I don't know them at the level that those who are giving you that endorsement have this morning. But the one thing that I do know over these years is simply this. When we set aside elders, there should be no surprise in the church. It should be obvious to everybody. Oh, it's a no-brainer. Those people, of course they would be elders. If it's a major surprise to you this morning, then we mustn't do it. Is it a major surprise to you this morning that these folk are going to be set aside? Well, that's the mark of endorsement, isn't it? When the body, the family says, of course, we recognize that they should be set aside. That's the kind of person that we can support, that we can pray for, and that will enjoy our support. It's not proportional representation. That only happens in Cape Town, in Parliament. And so we're not looking at, well, The young people have to have their representative here and the oldies have to have their representative here and every race group and every language group must have their representative. It's not this democracy where we all have to... If it's obvious to everybody, it doesn't matter what color scheme we are or what language we speak. Because eldership is about fathering and mothering. It's not about demographically being represented. And if the people coming in cannot minister across the board, they shouldn't be coming in. Because it's family. It's family. And then the last thing that I want to simply say is this. It's not a hierarchy or ranking. And the confidence that I have to say this this morning is it makes these folk here no more special than you in God's sight. You know, I, I had this thought when Queen Elizabeth II took her last breath and shuffled off the face of this earth. She was no more and no less normally human than you and I. Because at that point, the queen, the title, meant nothing. Because she stood before the king. Why? Because the kingdom principle that Jesus came to emphasize so often through the way he speaks to his disciples and the way he levels the Pharisees and the scribes and he speaks about the publicans and the worst of the sinners when he deals with the adulteress and all those kind of things. is This is the kingdom principle. We're all equal in value. We simply differ in our functions. And we can't all be leaders and we can't all be followers. God differentiates as He chooses so that the order that He needs within His body is set in place by Him. But it doesn't mean that those who get elevated to a position up here or in in leadership and that are any more valuable to Him than the person who has to have the reserved seat set aside here because they're actually greeting people in the front or people who are preparing coffee or people who somewhere along the line might even be cleaning the toilets for your, for your benefit this morning. Our value is not attached to what we do. Our value is attached to the fact that we are sons and daughters. So the function, the function is multiplied across this body. We're just recognizing this morning that some need to be put into place to help with the leadership of this body because having been a senior pastor ourselves for many, many years and having walked in the last 20 years with senior pastors across the world in our Church of the Nations network, I want to say one thing to you. It's a highly onerous and it's a very lonely place to be. Because unless you've walked in a senior pastor's moccasins, you have no idea of what they carry. No idea what they carry. Because a senior pastor can be the pastor to the president of the country and to the pauper at the same time. It is like no other position in this world. And for that reason, they need the support of others who say, I'm not signing up for this, but if this is what God wants me to do, I'm here to pull this cart with you. And that's why it's imperative that we don't resist leadership, we stand with them. Doesn't mean that we ignore um, 
glaring obvious weaknesses because it doesn't make them superstars or saints this morning. But it does mean that we watch what we say and where we say it about our leaders and that we first support rather than criticize. So I hope that that just offsets a little bit. I do want to urge you to watch what Wesley said this morning again and get this set in your heart so that what we are presenting, and there will be more as this church grows. There will be others that we will have to say, God, these are people that need to still come in and help. Because I believe God is bringing an order and a streamlining into Cedar Hill that is a very necessary corrective to all that goes on around about us. And the closer we get to elections this year, the more we're going to see posturing that is not of this kingdom, but of another kingdom. And the antidote to that is that we make sure we get it right here. So, um, where's Corrine, Shelley, Gavin, Wendy, Patrick and Mandy? Uh, have you got anybody else that you can to have up with us? Okay, that, now here's the thing as well. I just want to say, we're going to ask you to stand in just a moment. You guys come up so long. Um, I didn't quite know what to make of what Wesley introduced us as this morning about prophet, priest, king, um, whatever. You, 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 you never know what he's saying. Um, but, but here's the reality. Um, not much is said about Church of the Nations in this congregation, but you do know that that's where you belong. That's part and parcel of the life of this church. And in that, and now we just happen to be resident in a Toti in this season in our lives, but in that, Shelley and I have the responsibility on behalf of the Apostolic Council of Church of the Nations of walking primarily with Wes and Corrine, who, with whom we have walked now for some 10 or 12 years already. I can't believe it. It's gone that fast. And with this church. And so I, what I want to make clear this morning is that Shelley and I are standing here not as some kind of uh, big brother. We, we're standing here because what Wesley said is there are these various levels of accountability. We live our lives personally submitted to Tony and Marilyn Fitzgerald as our spiritual parents, but we're also accountable for our lives to the rest of the Apostolic Council. So I don't live my life footloose and fancy free. I'm held accountable. Shelley's held accountable in the same way as Wes and Corrine hold themselves accountable to Shelley and I. But in doing so, they're not holding themselves only accountable to us, but also to Tony and Marilyn and also to the Apostolic Council because that's where our alignment is. But Wesley and Corrine have been given specific charge to be the spiritual mom and dad in this house. We have an input from the side and are called in as and how that is necessary. Together with Gavin and Wendy, who have been the eldership up until this point, they govern the church together. And they, as elders this morning, in journeying for a number of years with Patrick and Mandy, have come to the conclusion, we have talked it through, they have spent lots of time talking it through, these guys have been willing to be considered. You have endorsed that by your verification this morning. It is the responsibility of the mom and dad and the eldership at this house to physically lay hands on Patrick and Mandy because they, in turn, are saying, we are saying to you, we take responsibility for the decision to put them in this house. My role, Shelley's role this morning, is for us from the outside because that is what we do, is to come and say to you, it's not just a decision that they've made arbitrarily or because Patrick and Mandy have paid them behind the scenes to say, hey, I want to buy that position. I'm saying to you, the buck doesn't just stop here. It also has an outside thing so that if you discern that this eldership are in trouble or there's sin or there's incorrect doctrine and, and you're worried, then you come to us because they hold themselves accountable to us. So in this today, these guys are going to have their hands laid on by the eldership and we in turn will stand and lay hands on Wes and Corrine and the eldership as a demonstration to you that Church of the Nations is standing with you and saying, this is the way. 
Listen to them now. Now, if you receive them, and now please, I want you to listen to this, and we're nearly done. If you receive Patrick and Mandy on the endorsement of the current eldership as a new eldership couple, if in your heart of hearts you, you witness with that, and you say they're the kind of couple that together with the other guys I can fully follow as leaders in this church, and only if you can say that, I want to ask you to stand so that they can see who it is. But, but don't do it hypocritically or just because there's peer pressure. Do it because in your heart of hearts you can say, I witness. They should be elders and I'm happy to stand with them. If you do that, then you need to stand right now. I just want to come into the middle and just come and stand around and Shelly and I will. You guys need to put your hands on. Let's just reach out to Patrick and Mandy. And Father, we thank you for a man and a woman of integrity. A man and a woman who, by testimony of so many and the, by those who are standing today, have been, have been witness to the fact that they live transparently, that their heart is fully devoted to you. And though they be human, Father, I want to thank you that in the lives that they live, there is a testimony of the grace and the goodness and the character of Jesus that they evidence. Father, as we set them into eldership this morning, we thank you that they have been willing to take up this charge. We thank you, Father, that they have not shirked away from it. And we thank you that they understand that primarily this morning they're coming in fulfillment of a function. This is not a title that they're grasping at, but it is a function that they are willing to perform. And in time, Lord, we'll be able to perform it alongside others that we know you're going to raise up to vouchsafe the security of this house called Cedar Hill. We thank you, Father, that um, there is a witness this morning in this house that people are standing and they're saying, yeah, well, it's obvious to us. It's a no-brainer. They're the kind of people that we see fathering and mothering in. And we're happy to stand and endorse them and to, and to support them as they come into this place of, of leadership. And Father, as Wes and Corrine and Gavin and Wendy have walked with Patrick and Mandy for many, many years now and have come to the conclusion that they should be drawn in, I pray that the load will be lifted even more in terms of leadership, that the tone and the DNA and the family dynamic of this church will be enhanced because we now have another couple walking with them and that this team, Lord, will be those watchmen on the wall who, who, who stand both to keep out that which shouldn't come in and to protect that which is inside. And so to you as a leadership team this morning, as you find a new rhythm amongst yourselves, I want to pray the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may you have grace and favor and discernment and understanding and rich wisdom. And above all, a humble spirit as you help to lead together those in your charge in this home. And we bless you now. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Awesome. So we're going to let you go in a moment. I just want to say thank you uh, to Keith and Shelley. And I'm so grateful for the Lord for their leadership. And um, Gavin and Wens, sorry, just one moment. Yeah. So thank you, Keith, for those wise words. It's always, when Keith gets up to speak, I go, oh, thank you, Jesus. We've got someone who can help us. <laughs> it's so full of wisdom and understanding. But I want to say this. Gavin and have said some things. I want to say, Patrick and Mandy, Corinne and I love and appreciate you. And we see on, on you guys God's gift to love and to care for people. You are amazing. I know there's people in your connect group here, been part of your connect group for many years. They want to stand up and say things about how amazing you guys are. And we are grateful. And we receive you as elders into this house to help us govern God and direct the people of God. But we love you and appreciate you. And you say thank you thank for you. saying yes. 
uh, to the function, to the responsibility of serving. Amen? Amen. Yeah, come on, let's give them some big praise. Thank you. So thank you, guys. Awesome. Everybody, have a wonderful God-filled week. Be blessed and uh, come and congratulate them if you have the opportunity. Love on them, but please pray for us. But thank you, everybody, for being with us this morning. Thank you so much for watching this week's sermon. We really pray that it has impacted you and has pu pulled you closer to God. So please like and subscribe, leave a comment, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to keep an eye out for any other content that we are posting on this channel and have an incredible week.